My guest this week is Sarah Hader. Sarah is the co-founder of Ex-Muslims of North America, an organization which advocates for the acceptance of religious dissent, promotes secular values, and aims to reduce discrimination of those who leave Islam. Also, according to her Twitter bio, she is Pakistani by birth and American by choice. Sarah, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me here, Dave. It's really good to be here. So I'm so glad we finally connected because we've been going back and forth for a couple of months and we seem to be sort of swimming in the same circles, uh, so to speak, lately. And I love that line. Let's just start with that line on your Twitter bio, Pakistani by birth and American uh, by choice. Why did you put that in there? Well, I, what a lot of people don't know about me is that I am an immigrant. Um, and I think that's a big part of my story. And in addition, I think that the American by choice means a lot because there are so many things about America that I love. There are so many uh, values that are uh, that are truly American that I think are, are wonderful. And in so many left-wing circles, it's unfashionable to say anything positive about America at all. <laughs> and I hope to be able to swim against that tide a little bit. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that as an immigrant that's doing good things in this country, you're allowed to maybe kind of say something nice about America. Are you a neocon now? Yeah, well, <laughs> Um, apparently, if you ask certain people, I am. But uh, I think that, you know, it took me so long to be able to get this citizenship. I only got it this year. And now I am fully an American citizen. And I feel so happy about it because this is a country I know so much about. And I've spent my entire, you know, most of my life here. And I feel so strongly that I am part of the American fabric. And I want to contribute to it however I can. Yeah, well, obviously, I love all that. And where I really became familiar with you was back in May when you gave this speech at the American Humanist uh, Association, which was really brilliant stuff. But I want to start first with a little bit of your history. When did you and your family come here from Pakistan? When did you sort of have your secular awakening, that kind of thing? Well, uh, I think I was about eight years old when I came to America. And I remember, I remember this being a, you know, a very strange new country for me. I remember learning the language, and I remember thinking it was very strange. <laughs> Um, I, I, I struggled a little bit in the first few years, but then uh, there was so much about America that I thought was just wonderful. And I mean, these concepts that we have that we take for granted, like you know, individual liberty and right to free speech and all these things, I mean, they, these don't exist in any form in so many parts of the world. Yeah. So the fact that we have it, you know, and I saw this with new eyes that, hey, here you can say anything. <laughs> I mean, not anything truly, but it, in a way that, in a way that isn't just comparable to anywhere else. And uh, so anyway, I became really immersed into American government and I thought it was really wonderful the way that, you know, the separation of powers, um, the Bill of Rights, I thought that was just fantastic stuff. And when I was about 16, 15 years old, uh, I began to have doubts about my faith. And a lot of it had to do with actually, uh, I mean, just debating and seeing new viewpoints. I was on the debate team, that helped. Uh, what did push me a little bit, I think, was meeting uh, what you would call militant atheists. You know, the obnoxious type. Oh, yeah, they're the worst, those militant atheists. Yeah, yeah, violent. <laughs> right, and the people that would, you know, get in your face. I and mean, there was one guy in particular, I knew a few, but there was one guy in particular who would print out verses from the Quran that were just horrible, right? These horrible verses, and he would just hand them to me and not say a word and just be like, this is, look at this. And, you know, this was my first time really, really looking into it. And I think this is the case for so many Christians and Jews and Muslims who leave religion, that they were like, well, you know, when I really looked into it, it didn't make a lot of sense, or there was some horrible stuff in there. Right. And for me, it was kind of a quest to prove these atheists wrong, you know? <laughs> uh, and uh, I started doing research online because I was sure that, that Islam was the way, and Islam was so good for women and women's rights, and um, all of this stuff could be explained when looked into context. And then I looked at the context. Sometimes I made things worse. Yeah. So then I thought, okay, well, time to admit defeat. And it didn't really take me a long time before I thought, this just doesn't make any sense. And yeah. it's not honest for me to say that I am a Muslim, given that I know all this now. Yeah, I love that you described the militant atheists. What did they have? They had photocopied paper. That, that was their weapon, you know what I mean? The, the other extremists, they have some more serious stuff. Like, you're going to get a paper cut, that's pretty much going to be the worst thing that's going to happen to you. 
right. And it's just, it's amazing to me. That's all that, that, that's all that it took, really. It's just here, this is what you believe. This is the book. This is your holy book. That's all it took. Yeah, so when, when they showed you that and you looked at this, uh, was your family, like, how religious was your family? How did your process of coming out, you know, I've described this, this process that atheists have to come out of the closet much like LGBT people do, that there is this hidden shame, this feeling of the otherness and all that. How long did that take before you had the realization versus when you told your family, your friends, that kind of thing? Well, so as far as that terminology, the coming out thing, that's so common in ex-Muslim circles. That's, that's what we use. We say, have you come out right. to your you know, do, are you out of the closet? That is the language that we use because that's a, that's the reality of it, isn't it? Yeah. Um, well, it what I what I did was I would just have debates with my family here and there about specific issues, and that's how they sort of got the message. I don't know if I explicitly said it for the first couple of years, um, but I was lucky. I'm very lucky in that I have a truly liberal father and. By liberal, I mean, okay, I still wasn't allowed to wear certain kinds of clothing, right? I still couldn't wear shorts in the house. I still couldn't have, you know, uh, boyfriends or anything like that or date. I'm, I was expected to get an arranged marriage and everything. Wait, where's the liberal part coming? It's coming? Right, but that's, that's liberal. It's liberal in the sense that he allowed me to, my father allowed me to read what I wanted to read, and he didn't question it too much because he thought I would end up in the right place at the end. So that was a sense of freedom. And... I only had to fight for uh, maybe a year or two to be able to go away for college. So that was that was my liberal father. <laughs> God, it's so funny how it's so funny how terms and words really mean a lot. You know, before you refer to you say something nice about America, the left will you know say you're a neocon. And in and in this context, you describe your liberal father, but you know you couldn't wear shorts and that kind of stuff. And yet, clearly within that space, he was liberal. It's amazing. He was very liberal, I and mean, he was very liberal in the sense that he he gave me a sort of dignity as as a woman that I think that wasn't given it, it isn't given by many Muslim men to their daughters and to their wives and even mothers, and so I I consider myself lucky. I I know that sounds interesting, but I I do consider myself very lucky that my childhood was, it was similar to maybe what very conservative almost fundamentalist Christians would have, and yeah. that. I consider myself lucky that I didn't, I wasn't forced to wear the hijab. I, I did wear it for a short amount of time by choice, um, but it wasn't forced upon me. Um, so it, it is it is interesting what we consider liberal and what's considered liberal anywhere else in the world. Yeah, and that's one of the interesting things and one of the reasons why I wanted to talk to you because, you know, there are so many stories you hear about, you know, ex-Christians leaving, you hear about ex-Jews leaving, you know, Orthodox Judaism, something like that, where they're then considered heroes on the left. Ah, they left this dogmatic, conservative ideology. Uh, but you don't hear about many people like you, and I've recently connected with a bunch, and it's like you're so obviously standing up for the basic liberal values that we all talk about all the time. Right. It's, it's so bizarre to be in this space. I mean, I feel strange uh, that I'm here because I feel <laughs> like I have enemies, like people who just don't like what I'm saying for one reason or another. And my narrative is, a, is a, like you said, a classically liberal one. Right. I mean, it's, it's something that on the face of it should be something every liberal should support. But there is, there is such a tendency on the left to protect uh, Muslims, uh, to protect them from bigotry. And these fears of bigotry, I would say, I mean, they're, they're real, yeah. right? They're, it's not a, it's not, they're not making this up. It is, it is a fear and it's a real fear. Uh, but the response has been what I would call reactionary. It's interesting because they say the reactionary right. And I think what, what, what your response to Islam is also very reactionary. You're also not looking at it in, from an objective point of view. Yeah, well, it seems to me we've got the reactionary right and the regressive left. But I, I want to hold that for a second because I want to talk about the speech that you gave because it was really wonderful and I saw it blowing up on Twitter and a zillion people were sending it to me and I watched it again yesterday in preparation for this. And, you know, we talk about this coming out process, but I, you sort of reference that in this. It seemed to me like, obviously, without knowing you, and this is the first time we spoke, but it seemed like your entire life had led up to that very moment. Am I being very dramatic there? <laughs> um, well, I, it was something that I was extremely nervous doing. I mean, and I don't know, I think it showed in the video that I, it showed that I was nervous, and I was because I felt um, ever since I've been doing this activism now, it's been three years that I've been doing ex-Muslim activism. 
I am blindsided by the reaction of the left. I really thought, you know, and, and this is something that I hear from activists everywhere. I hear that they thought they would come here and they would talk to people on the left and they would find allies. They would find people who are willing to support them and were willing to give at least moral support, if not anything else, but mm -hmm. they would find their brothers. And I found that in so many ways, people I considered my brothers and my sisters uh, in this struggle uh, have overlooked me for what seems like a very political, very, a very political reason. And the, what I was feeling, um, especially around the time I was giving that speech, uh, it was after the Charlie Hebdo um, shootings. And I was feeling extremely disheartened by the sec even the secular community overall. Mm -hmm that there were so many people that were saying, well, you know, they, uh, that in some ways it could be justified and Islamophobia, Islamophobia and all this stuff that didn't really make a lot of sense. And I was feeling abandoned. And so I thought, you know, they gave me this opportunity to have this speech, so I'm going to just speak my mind. I think maybe they expected me to talk a little bit about my, mo mostly about my organization, but I ended up sort of hijacking that conversation and talking about that. Yeah, well, I, first off, I, I mean, I recommend that everyone that's watching this should absolutely watch that because we can only touch on, on some of what you, what you did there. Um, but the reaction from the left, uh, you know, it's a lot of what we've spent this show talking about. And the more that I try to get away from it, you know, I've tried to address it so that I could move away from it. I want these people to understand that someone like you, that someone like me, that we, we are standing up for liberal values. But it's not just that they've ignored you. In a lot of ways, these people have sort of actively tried to undermine you, don't you think? Right, and there, and, and there is, it's, it's not just undermining, it's, it's sliming, right? And there, there's people that have questioned my agenda and what am, I, what am I doing this for? I mean, I don't, you know, I don't, I'm not gaining anything from this. I mean, in, the, in, the, in a lot of ways, this comes at a high personal cost. And I yeah. think it's for many ex-Muslim that, that speak out. Um, but there are so many people that are, that are very intent on painting me as a right-wing show. And I get this all the time. And I even get this from people who I thought would be my allies, from atheists, from leftists. Um, so it's, what, what do you make of that tactic, just that general tactic, that it's not about what you say? Because if anyone was to listen to that speech or hopefully anything that we're going to talk about here, I'm going to guess that you're going to line up with liberal values 99% of the time. So it's rarely about what you say. It's about who you are and that you don't fit into their neat little box of, of what a Muslim should believe, which is crazy to me. Well, I... I actually disagree with you. I think it is what you say in the sense that if you're talking negatively about Islam at all, at all, from on, on any perspective, right. it doesn't matter if you're fueled by human rights or fueled by bigotry, whatever, it doesn't matter. If you are touching negatively on Islam on any level, you are a bigot. Right. And it doesn't matter how you say it, because a lot of people say this to me. They say, well, what would you tell, you know, Richard Dawkins or Sam Harris, you know, if you think there's a way they can say their critique uh, that would be beneficial? And what I tell them is, or what I ask them instead is, uh, well, can you think of somebody who has directly uh, critiqued Islam in a, in a direct way uh, that has gotten away with it, that hasn't been called a bigot by mm -hmm. someone? You know, how do you, how, what is the right way of saying this? Point me to an example of somebody who's critiquing Islam and has been able to, you know, get away and still retain their liberal credentials. Yeah, and that's the part of this that drives me nuts because, you know, when I started the show only a couple months ago, my intention was not to talk about this stuff this much. But as I said, I can't get out of it because as a liberal, I see people like you and I say this is this is the the very people, regardless of your religion, if, if you were an ex-Christian, as I said, or if you were an ex-Jew, I would feel the same way about the principles that you're standing up for.